Good morning. Thank you, Sam, for leading us in our beginning to worship today. And I hope you uh, feel that as we gather together, as we hear uh, the piano preparing us for our continued worship all this morning. And, uh, you know, it's only two weeks till Easter. Can you imagine that? Next week's Palm Sunday, and then after that, Easter. We've had the privilege all this time to be focusing on uh, many songs that focus on the cross of Christ, and that'll be the case again today. And we want to start with one that asks a question. What can I gain from what Christ did? And can it be? Would you please stand as we worship together today?
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you for your wonderful gifts. Thank you for your son. And thank you for this morning that we can uh, praise, honor, and worship you. Lord, I just ask that as we gather together, Lord, that you would, you are here in the midst, Lord, that we, we would lift you up. And uh, Lord, help us to uh, uh, understand and receive the word this morning from Pastor. Lord, help us to examine our hearts, Lord, that we would honor, glorify you with everything we do and say. Lord, we love you very much and we give you all the glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. morning. It's good to see everyone. We want to welcome you here this morning. If this is your first time at McCoy Memorial Baptist Church, we're thankful that you've joined us to worship this morning. If this is your first time in the pew in front of you, should be a a connection card. Sorry. You can pull that connection card out, fill it out. Uh, We want to know you by name, know that you're here. In a few minutes, our ushers will take up an offering. If you could place that in the offering plate, that'd be your gift to us. We also, though, have a welcome table in the foyer to the left as you leave the sanctuary. Stop by. We have a gift for you, information about our ministries. We're just thankful that you're here, and we want to be able to know you and know you by name. Uh, A couple announcements. First of all, we have an exciting morning this morning. We've got some baptisms, which are always a highlight as people publicly profess uh, their, their profession and belief in Jesus Christ. But I also want to mention that today we have a special Sunday school hour. We're continuing on in our process. Today, stick around, is our Q&A. So Pastor Ray made his announcement of his retirement. Then we talked about IPM, Interim Pastor Ministries. Steve and Becky shared with us what to expect during a pastoral transition. Now today is your opportunity to ask questions. And uh, we're going to attempt to answer those questions. So stick around for Sunday School. It's going to be a great time. We will not be live streaming that, but we will record that and send that out to the church. Um, Also want to mention, next week we're back to normal Sunday School. I'm looking forward to that, being with my class again. I hope you are too. So plan next week. Keep staying and enjoy that time as we dig deeper into God's Word and apply it in a deeper way and encourage one another. And... um, Also, just want to mention real quick, men's retreat, April 21st, 22nd, 23rd, sign up. There's a sign up in the foyer on the bulletin board by the library. In Sunday school, we'll pass out some sign-up sheets as well. Pastor? Good morning. Good to see each and every one today. It really is. Um, um, Charlie mentioned that Easter Sunday is two weeks from today. That has come upon us, hasn't it? And looking forward to a wonderful day and Palm Sunday next Sunday. But in between there is Good Friday, April the 7th, less than two weeks away. And the Fundamental Pastors Fellowship of Elkhart County is having a joint uh, Good Friday service. It'll be on Friday, April 7th, Good Friday at 12 noon and be over at 1 So just uh, right in the middle of the day there, and we have a nice service being planned of great singing, scripture reading, a message from God's word as we think about Good Friday and what that represents. So McCoy people, I encourage you to be out for that, as many of you as can, and other pastors are announcing that right now for their churches and challenging them to be there. Lots of pastors will be involved in either ushering or taking the offering or uh, being up here and doing different things. But um, we'll look forward to a good, good Friday service. Here at McCoy. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, Julie. Uh, it's here at McCoy. Okay. I'd like to ask the ushers if they would come at this time. And we'll give honor to the Lord as we receive our tithes and offerings and giving giving them to the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for this moment in the service. It's part of worship what we're doing. Every part of this service is worship. And we're grateful that we can honor you and do it well because it is worship. As we honor you and adore you and give to your work And it's not only to this local congregation, but missionaries that we support worldwide. We're grateful that we have a part in it, and we're thankful that we can honor you in this manner. In Jesus' most precious name, I pray. Amen.
Lord, I confess this with humiliation. It's shameful to admit, but it's true. I don't have the capacity to imagine the cost, the agony, the loneliness, the depravity that you took as your own, the despair of being abandoned even by your father, the suffocation in your lungs and in your heart, one friend turning his back, then all of them, not only Pharisees condemning you, but criminals and strangers too. How did you endure it? How did you look over my life, over all of our lives, and think that we were worth it? Your great obedience and trust of your Father made you more than any of us could ever be. Even still, you're willing to love me. Astonishing. My heart fills with sorrow and overflows with gratitude. When I look at that cross, I can do nothing more than lay my disobedience at your feet while you suffer for it. Forgive me. I know what I did. I know what I do. You're my only hope of salvation. Amen. charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, 
the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and the, sin, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything now had been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine of vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. That phrase, it is finished, is a reminder of what was accomplished for us on the cross. We want to introduce a new song to you that builds on that very phrase. It is called, It Was Finished Upon the Cross. Pay attention to the words, pick up the, the, the melody, it's not hard, and let's rejoice in what Jesus finished on the cross for us. Would you please stand?
that on that cross, you finished the work of salvation for each one of us, and that you rose again, and you are risen, you are our victor, and we have our hope only in you, and we praise and thank you in Jesus' name. Why shouldn't I be baptized? That's a great question. That question comes from Acts chapter 8, verse 26 through 40, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And I'd like to ask you to open to that passage, Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 26, a great, great story. Because, folks, this is where you and I live. This is how it happens for us. We're just going about doing life. And God brings somebody into our midst, into our life, and we get to share the Lord Jesus Christ with them. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of Scripture. And this is Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Six times in those two verses, the word he or him. And the eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet Isaiah? Who is the prophet talking about? Is he talking about himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Notice the word began. Did you notice that? He began with that very passage. And the reason is because in Luke 24, Jesus said this, and beginning, or Luke says this, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So Philip obviously went to other passages in talking to this man. Verse 36, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders, that is the eunuch gave orders, to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. The question, why shouldn't I be baptized, 
was asked by an Ethiopian official, the Treasury Secretary of Candace, Queen of the Ethiopians at that time, early first century. He was on his way home from worshiping in Jerusalem. He was not Jewish, he was a Gentile. He was not a, he had not yet become a Jewish proselyte. He was one of those people that the Bible refers to as a God fearer. He was attracted for some reason and in some circumstance of his life, he was attracted to monotheism. The, the belief that there is one God that the Jews was at the, at the very foundation of their religion. He was attracted to that and the morality that came from it. So the Lord was working in this man's life. And as he was, as he was going back, and let me just say, he was not a believer. He did not know the Lord at this moment. But as they were traveling back to Egypt, to, I mean to uh, Ethiopia, he was reading Isaiah 53. But he did not know about whom the passage was speaking. And it was Philip, the evangelist, that led this man to faith in Jesus. Now, it's this guy, Philip, he, the Bible calls him later in the book of Acts, Philip, the evangelist. The Bible says that God has given to the church gifted people. He's given gifts to us personally, and he's given gifts to the church. He gave some to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastor teachers. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, till we all come to the unity in the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. So Philip was a gift to the church. He was an evangelist. And we see that in Acts chapter 8, look at verse 6, when the crack, after Paul started persecuting believers in Jerusalem, the Bible says everyone was scattered except the apostles scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And it says, they went, wherever they went, they preached the word. Verse 5, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. And when the crowds, he spoke to crowds, like a Billy Graham assembly, when, he, when, he, when the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. And then look at verse 12. When they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and of the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And now the Lord sends Philip down to talk to an individual, this official from Ethiopia. And he leads him to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as they're going along the road, they're continuing down the road as Philip's talking to him, and it says that the eunuch, they came to some wa water and the eunuch said, look, here's some water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? Now, some very, very late manuscripts add this verse, verse 37. Philip said to him, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So then both, he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. God caught, caught Philip away to some other place, but this man went on his way rejoicing. So in this one chapter, we see Philip the evangelist introducing the gospel to, the, to Samaria, to the Samaritans. And we see this man, Philip, opening the door of the gospel to the Ethiopians in North Africa. God got them out of Jerusalem. They were huddled in, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, Samaria, and to the remotest places of the earth. And God uses people like this Philip and you and me to do that. It's exciting passage. 
because it relates to me and it relates to you because this is where we are as we talk to people, as they live next to us, as whatever. And the Lord enables us and gives us opportunity to share with them. This morning we have the opportunity to hear two testimonies and to witness two baptisms. And in preparation, I want to take the opportunity to teach on the why, the who, the how, and the what of Christian water baptism. I don't do this very often. However, every once in a while, I think it's good with the whole church here to go over what the Bible says about this. Who, why, who, how, and what. Why, who, how, and what. The first question, and I'm way behind in my uh, stuff here, or we're not there yet. Before we get there, let me just say this, that Jesus gave his disciples, that is the 12, Jesus gave his disciples two ordinances, two ordinances ordinances and they were to obey these ordinances throughout this age until Jesus comes he gave them to the 12 you know why because Ephesians 2 verse 20 makes it very plain that you are no longer foreigners and aliens but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So the Lord himself gave these two ordinances to his 12 to practice and practice until the Lord comes. Ordinances. What is an ordinance? Well, we should know what that means. What is an ordinance? An ordinance, according to the dictionary, is an authoritative decree or direction, an order. A law set forth by a governmental authority, specifically a municipal regulation. The city of Elkhart has ordinances. It's a city ordinance. Something ordained or decreed by fate or a deity. This is a secular dictionary. A prescribed usage, a practice or a ceremony. It's and a synonym, synonym would be a law. A ordinance is an order, a regulation, a law that God gave to the twelve and to the church to practice until the Lord returns. Sometimes churches refer to these and they add other ones in addition to these two, but these are the two in the Bible that Jesus prescribed and ordered. Two. But sometimes churches refer to them as sacraments. A sacrament is a word we generally stay away from because it's a Christian rite, such as baptism or the Eucharist, that's the bread and the cup, that is believed to have been ordained by Christ and that is held to be a means of divine grace. That's what we avoid. It's believed to be a means of divine grace. You know, in the very early times of my time here at McCoy, I remember there was, I'm thinking of one person in particular that only came to church the time we had communion. The only time they came. I don't know this for sure, but I, I suspect that that person believed that by partaking of the bread and the cup, which is not here this morning, but by partaking of the bread and the cup, she would somehow be secured in some way, in getting to heaven. Don't know that for sure, but it's just odd that they did that. But people have this idea that it's the church that's going to get me to heaven. It's through the sacraments that I'm okay and I'm, and, and I'm at peace with God. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. We just sang a beautiful new song called It Is Finished Upon the Cross. We don't believe that, but we do believe that there are ordinances, don't we? Yeah. And so the first one that the Lord gave was the Lord's Supper. It happened the night before the Lord Jesus was crucified. At, and he had the Passover meal with his disciples. And at the Passover meal, in the upper room, the night before his crucifixion, Jesus broke bread, gave it to them. 
This is my body, which is given, which is for you. As often as you eat this bread, do it in remembrance of me. And then he took a cup. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you partake of it, do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, I'm already quoting it, as long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing, proclaiming the Lord's death until he returns. And then 40 days later, 40 days later, at the time of his ascension into heaven, just before he gathered the 12, his disciples, to that mountain in Galilee. And just before his ascension and his high exaltation at the Father's side, the order was given as part of the church planting commission. Matthew 28, Jesus said this, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore... As you go, or in, as you're going, make disciples of all the nations. Notice he didn't say make converts. Get decisions. He didn't say that. Because becoming a disciple is much bigger than that. It means be a lifelong learner, a follower, one who's going to serve the Lord as you grow in the Lord. Make disciples of all nations. Here's how you do that. As you evangelize those that respond, you baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and then you teach them to obey. Did you notice that? It's not academics. It's not teach them to know more about the Bible. It's teach them to what? Obey. It's teaching with clout to follow the Lord, to put off the old man, the old self, to put on the new, to grow and change its teaching with clout for life transformation and growth and change into the likeness and image of Christ. Teach them to obey everything I commanded you. Everything. Now, does that happen overnight? No, that's why this is called the Church Planting Commission. Because the church, the local church, is so important in the development of our faith and life to become disciples of Jesus Christ. It, has such, it is so crucial to our walk and our nurture and our growth and a place to serve and, and, and use our giftings that God has given to us. Jesus loves the church. And I don't mean this concept of everybody in the church. He loves the church, and it's a local expression in local churches. And every believer needs to be a part of, formally connected to, a church where they're being blessed and where they're blessing others with the gifting God has given to them. That's what this is. So there they are. In our doctrinal statement at McCoy Memorial Baptist Church, has 12 articles, and the number nine is we believe in two church ordinances, baptism being the immersion of the believer in water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, thus symbolizing the believer's precious previous experience of regeneration, already been saved through faith and his or her union in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as set forth in Romans 6, 3 through 11. The Lord's Supper, instituted by Christ, being a symbol of his atoning sacrifice. So, the first question is really easy to answer. Why baptize? And the answer is very simple. The Lord commanded it. And I, in my baptism classes, when I meet with uh, people that are going to be baptized, we have about an hour class when I go over this and work through the scriptures. I, right at the beginning, we go to Matthew 28 and I cover this. And here's what I cover. What did Jesus tell his disciples to do? Look at the Matthew 28, you know, and what did Jesus tell his disciples to do? Here's what he said. Go, or as you go, as you're going, make disciples. That's the idea of evangelizing, sharing the good news. 
so that they understand the gospel and have a chance to receive it and respond. Then what did he tell them to do? Baptize them. And then what did he tell them to do? Teach them. And here's the point. The second part of Jesus' instruction is just as important as the other two. Since baptism is a command and order, refusal to be baptized constitutes disobedience to the Lord. Have I missed something? No, that's what it says, right? It's not an option when we get around to it. It is, it is, a, it is something that the Lord said to do because it is such a powerful witness and such a visual of what really happened when you got saved. So, because the Lord commanded, and what I do is we go to Matthew 28, we read that, and it's usually within the first 10 minutes of our class or something like that, and I say, okay, let's close our Bibles, the class is done, let's go home. Because what more do you need? Jesus said it. He commanded it. What, what are we talking about? Let's just obey the Lord. Why baptize? Very, very clear. Secondly, who should be baptized? Who should be baptized? Well, it is clear from the New Testament that only believers are to be baptized. Only believers. Those have already made a decision of faith to trust Jesus Christ, they've understood the gospel and by faith they've responded and trusted Christ and they're saved. Only believers are to be baptized. Trusting Jesus Christ as personal Savior is the clear prerequisite for baptism. And you know, as, as we look at Jesus' command in Matthew 28, part of the Great Commission we see that that's exactly what the apostles and the early church did. Then what we do in our class is we, we, we walk our way through the book of Acts and we see eight instances in which it says this, people believed and then what? Were baptized. They believe it. We think of Acts 2, 41 on the day of Pentecost Peter spoke up and explained what was going on because they all got it wrong. They all had their theories, but they were all wrong. So Peter stood up and says, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover, Peter explained and preached that God has made this Jesus, whom you cru crucified, both Lord and Christ, and what you see here today is a result of him being glorified and pour, God the Father has given him the spirit to pour out on this crowd. 3,000 people were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and added to the church. We see Philip. We already looked at these. Philip, the evangelist ministry in Samaria, he introduced and opened the door of the gospel among the Samaritan people. And then Acts 8, 36, Philip, the evangelist ministry in Gaza to an important Ethiopian official, opening the gospel to North Africa. As this man went home with joy in his heart to tell others about Jesus. And then in Acts chapter 9, Saul Saul the Pharisee, as he was seething in rage and looking for people to Christians, these followers of Jesus, the way to imprison and kill. He was making his way up to Damascus, having done, having, having done damage in Jerusalem, going to Damascus, and on that road, Jesus stopped him. And Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, got saved. And he was blind for three days in Damascus, Syria. And Ananias was sent to open his eyes. And when, it, when he opened his eyes, it, he, it says, and he was baptized. Acts 10, Cornelius among the Gentiles, a Roman uh, a military official or soldier, and an officer, a Roman centurion, in Caesarea on the Mediterranean coast, Peter, led he and his family to the Lord. 
Acts 16, at Philippi, there's a businesswoman, a seller in purple clothing, and she was on a business trip, and she's in Philippi, and she came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 16, we see the Roman jailer in Philippi, and he and his family believed the gospel, and it says at that hour they were baptized. In Acts 18, 4, in Corinth, Crispus, the synagogue ruler, his entire household and many Corinthians believed and were baptized. We see exactly what Jesus said being, being carried out in Acts. They believed and they were baptized, which answers the next question, and that is this. What about infant baptism? I want to say two things about infant baptism. First of all, the baptism of infants is an unscriptural practice. It is not taught in the New Testament. And there are no examples of infants being baptized. The Bible teaches believers' baptism. And I also think something else. The baptism of infants is a harmful practice, spiritually. It leaves the impression that personal faith is unnecessary. After all, I'm already in Christ. It gives a person a false sense of security and hope. I'm now a part of the church. I've been placed in Christ. I've been christened. Oh, yeah, that happened when I was a kid. No evidence of the new birth. What about infant baptism? It's unscriptural. It's harmful. What about this one? How should baptism be administered? Well, churches baptize in three ways. Aspersion, sprinkling, effusion, pouring, or immersion, dunking. Immersion, dunking. And there are several reasons why immersion alone should be practiced. And the reasons are these. First of all, our English word baptize comes from the New Testament Greek word Baptizo, which means to dip or to immerse. Baptizo. In fact, the letters, the Greek letters, are just basically carried over to form the English word baptize. It means, that word means to dip, to immerse, like washing pots and pans or cleaning off a sword after a battle in the river. That's how it's used outside of the New Testament. Baptizo means to dip, to immerse, to place into. A second reason, every instance of water baptism in the New Testament where any details are given imply, notice I said imply, that baptism was by immersion. For example, it says in John 3.23, John also was baptizing at Enon near Salem. Why there? Because there was plenty of water and people were constantly coming to be baptized. What about Jesus' baptism? Jesus replied, let it be so. John was hesitant, John the Baptist, to baptize him. But Jesus said, let it be so. It's proper for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented, and as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And then Acts 8. He gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And then, the last reason, only baptism by immersion most accurately symbolizes the reality behind the rite or the ritual. I mean, it's powerful. It's powerful. We are symbolizing our identification with the Lord Jesus Christ in his death and burial to sin and in his resurrection to a new way of life. And when that believer who gives his testimony is laid back, that is a picture of death and burial and then resurrection to a new direction, a life of service and growth and commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the, the right ought to symbolize the reality behind it. And then last question, what is the significance of baptism? 
Well, though it is closely associated with salvation, especially in the New Testament, people were baptized right away. It was a public way of standing out and confessing your faith, your death to the old life, your identification with Jesus Christ to a new way and direction. Though it's closely associated with salvation, baptism has nothing whatsoever to do with obtaining, obtaining forgiveness and eternal life. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone boast. And then one other thing. Baptism is a public confession of a believer's faith in the Lord's death and resurrection for salvation, of a believer's cleansing from the old life of sin, and third, a believer's commitment to a new life characterized by righteousness. And we have the opportunity of participating in that this morning, and we're thankful. Let's pray. Our most gracious God and precious Heavenly Father, we're so excited for Samantha and we're, for Mike. We thank you for what we're going to hear from them, how you're working and have worked in their lives. And we're just so grateful that we can hear them and uh, hear their stories this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I invite you to stand and let's continue our worship as the, those who are being baptized uh, prepare. My word is not in what I
You may be seated. Just needed to make sure the 220 was unplugged. <clears throat> all right, we first of all have Mike Kratzer who is going to come and share his testimony and then uh, Mike will be baptized. Mike, come on down. Before being saved, I lived for myself. Life was all about what I or any, anyone else could do for me. I was spiritually dead. I had even heard the truth but resisted. I attended church, sang songs, sort of listened to the teachers, knew a few verses and where some of the books were in the Bible, but deep down inside, I wouldn't let control of my own world. Unlike many believers' testimonies, I can't give an exact date and time of when I was saved. That always bothered me. I felt a little ashamed and even doubted my salvation at times. I spent a lot of time searching for anything that I might have missed. I think I might have been saved around fifth grade, though I don't remember the exact time. I do remember the moment. I was sitting in a pew at First Baptist Church Elkhart when it was on Prairie Street. My Sunday school teacher, Mr. Beatty, was with me. I remember being broken over my sin I remember asking the Lord for forgiveness and to come into my life. I don't know if I was truly converted at this point. Was I crying because I realized my sin and my need for Jesus? Or was it because I got caught in my sin, like getting caught with my hand in the cookie jar? I really don't know for sure. I do know as time went on, I grew away from the Lord, quit going to church, and was living for myself again that I always had a feeling of something holding on to me, like on the back of my shirt collar. It wasn't a voice or anything all that obvious. I now know it was the Lord holding on to me. He directed me through darkness even when I didn't know I was in darkness. He allowed me to go far enough into valleys of sin, but never let me fall all the way down in them. Eventually that feeling faded. I was finally lonely and discouraged enough that one night, I got down on my knees and asked the Lord to remove me from where I was in my life. He granted my request, but not quite in the way I would have envisioned. He took me on a journey around the country over a few years. Slowly but surely, the Lord separated me from the things of this world and drew me nearer to him. I don't know if I was saved back in that pew with Mr. Beatty in fifth grade or sometime years later. I do, now, I do know, no matter what has happened in the past, that the Lord has been faithful. I now have confidence and assurance from God's word that the Lord has saved me through Jesus' death on the cross. It was Jesus' blood that took care of my sin. He experienced the kind of death that I deserve, but now I don't have to. He came back to life victorious over death. From whenever my conversion happened, my life has drastically changed. It hasn't been all at once. In my growth, I see the world differently now. My priorities have changed. My desire for God's word, fellowship with other believers, and serving others is ever increasing. I am constantly gaining love for others. I find I am less, less and less critical and judgmental of others. I am more patient and understanding. I examine things through a biblical lens. And I, I definitely don't do all these things all the time or perfectly, but I'm a work in progress. I admit I've been saved for a while now before being baptized. When I was younger, I was shy and intimidated to be in front of people. Later, I just didn't take the command from Jesus himself seriously enough. Eventually, life just carried me away. But Jesus willingly came to this earth, was not shy about who he is, and went to the cross and died in front of the whole world for me. I need to be baptized. It's not required as a part of my salvation, but it is out of obedience to my Lord. So I can be a witness for my Lord. This baptism isn't about me, it's about what the Lord has done. Mike, 
thank you for your testimony. And based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Well, it's a privilege to have Samantha Castillo here to share her story and to be baptized. Okay, Samantha, nice and clear. We want to hear it. All right. So I'm Samantha. <laughs> um, I am 20 years old, and I grew up in a non-Christian household. Um, I was introduced to Christianity in elementary school at Happy Day Club. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I can't really remember remember a lot before um, since I was so young, but I'd say I was just like any other disobedient little child, you know. Um, uh, I believe it was first grade when one of my friends invited me to Happy Day Club. At the time, the lovely Weavers had taught um, had taught a um, Happy Day Club, so um, so I got to learn about Jesus and meet the Weavers. Um, in third or fourth grade, they had raised the question of asking Jesus into our hearts. Um, I did not fully understand at the time what it meant to be saved, um, but as I got older, I started going to McCoy, and I started going to Awana with the Weavers. Uh, I began to understand that we all have sin, and that Jesus died because he loved us, and because he wanted to take away our sins so that we may join him in heaven. He gave us a chance to live a better life that w than we are born into and to share it with others. Uh, so realizing this, I began to be more kind-hearted and more obedient. I felt more confident and happy because I wanted to share the good news of Jesus with other people. So I invited some of my friends to Awana and to church. I went to a Christian camp all the way up until I was old enough to be a camp counselor. And when I got asked to become a camp counselor, of course I took it. Um, being a counselor for a few camps and knowing just how much it was going to impact those kids just made my love for God stronger. Because I know how much it meant to me at that time. So you know, I even shared one of my favorite verses that had gotten me through tough times with one of my campers. She was absolutely terrified when we were in this canoe. She was scared that the canoe would tip. <laughs> so she was just, oh, she was just terrified. Um, but I reassured her, and I told her the verse, and she calmed down, and she had even had me write it down for her so that she could remember. Um, so fear and anxiety have kind of always been a challenge for me to deal with, but that verse has always really helped me, and it's Joshua 1.9, which says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So just think of that. It just makes me stop and just take a breath. Uh, to remember to put faith in and trust God, because it's hard not knowing what the future holds for me, but I know that God will be with me all the way. Through all the challenges I have faced, God has always been there. Whether it was dealing with depression, high school drama, or just being away from home, marching up and down those rough hills. Um, God was right there, guiding me through each painful, tiring step to so steps towards some of the biggest, proudest moments of my life. No matter what challenges I have yet to face, I know to trust, trust the process, because God's got my back no matter what. Samantha, thank you for your testimony, and we're praising the Lord with you. And uh, upon uh, the basis of your testimony, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
baptism. Uh, baptism is a, a time of rejoicing, and uh, your, your response shows that and how we all rejoice with Mike and Samantha if they, if they have taken that step today. But may our rejoicing be in Christ our Savior. So we're going to close with a repeat of the, of the song we did right before the baptism and, and focusing. And uh, remember those words, I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. Please stand. Two wonders here that I confess, my worth and my unworthiness, my value fixed, my ransom paid at the cross. I rejoice in my name. together today to focus on the cross and what you did there and your words it is finished it gives us hope and joy and we have seen that in these two that have been baptized and we rejoice in their testimonies and what you have done in their lives but most of all Lord Jesus we rejoice in you and we praise and thank you thank you for this day and the time that we will have together yet today we praise this, pray all this now in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.